Welcome to cast and creatives from Paramore. Please take a seat. Don't wait on me. So this show uh, obviously is the, the first in Broadway show from Cirque du Soleil, which makes it incredibly interesting and unique in its own right. But before we get into that, I want to go down the line here and uh, introduce yourselves, say what you do in the show. Oh, ladies first. Ladies first. There we go. Um, my name's Ruby Lewis. I play Indigo. Um, it's my first Cirque du Soleil show and my first Broadway show. Hi, my name's Seth. I'm the music director of the show. This is my fourth Cirque du Soleil show and uh, first Broadway show. You want to clap in between? Uh, okay. uh, hi, my name is Claudette Waddle. I'm the production stage manager on Paramore. This is my ninth or twelfth, depending on how you count it, Cirque du Soleil show, and my Broadway debut. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Thomas. Uh, it's my first show on Broadway and first show for Cirque du Soleil, actually. And I'm really excited about it, actually. <laughs> Not the first show being super strong, though. No. Uh, Always. Yes. And I'm an acrobat in the show. I'm not, I'm not a singer. No. <laughs> and I'm not the lead, for sure. Hi, my name is Rafael. Uh, I'm an acrobat as well. This is my Broadway debut, first contract with Cirque du Soleil. And I play a little role of Sid, little character, and nobody really knows about it. Nobody even but he's attention. the bodyguard. <laughs> Nobody pays attention. And, yeah, this oh, don't is, say that. Yeah. I noticed you guys. I know, yeah. Sometimes they do. It's like everybody gets on stage and looks away when you get up there. You're like, oh, that guy. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so I guess for the, for the two of you, um, being that this is your first uh, contract with Cirque, how did you get involved with Cirque in the first place? Uh, actually, like, I started when I was like a little kid called, uh, with sport called uh, Sport Acro which is very popular in, in Europe. It's not so, so much in, here in the US. And later on, uh, I was introduced to, uh, to Cirque with uh, the guy who used to work for Cirque du Soleil for a show called Mister. And he kind of introduced us to the, to the idea, and I loved it, and I jumped run right to it. And that's how I started, but that was like, oh my god, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, with me, like, I have pretty much the same story as Thomas, uh, I was, I did, actually I started as a gymnast and I didn't really fit in the, <laughs> the typical gymnast body Aren't type. Aren't gymnasts very small? Yeah, <laughs> so I got kicked out to <laughs> acrobatics and there I found my way as a porter, which I'm still performing as a porter in, in acrobatic world, I'm always a bass. 
and uh, porter was, porter means base yes yeah. i'm usually like on the ground lifting uh tossing and uh, throwing catching people <laughs> and yeah. yeah i started when i was eight years old and now i'm a little bit older and i, I was working with the, the same company as tom like in poland and then we find our way to to las vegas to show called la ref and now we're here <laughs> So, Ruby, uh, your story, I guess, is a little bit different. You didn't come the acrobatic route, because <laughs> being a leading lady, yeah. Um, interestingly, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Your personal discovery on the, or how you got discovered to be on the show is mirrors pretty much exactly how your character was discovered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all been very parallel in a really weird way. Which is what? Um, I was I was in L.A. I was there for five and a half years, and I was working with a theater company there called For the Record. and. We were doing a show called For the Record Baz. It was all Baz Luhrmann films and songs from the soundtracks. And a representative from Cirque du Soleil Theatrical and some guys came to the club in LA and saw me perform and saw me sing. I, I, I played Daisy from The Great Gatsby and I got to sing some really awesome songs. They loved the show and they wanted to pick it up and do a production of it in Vegas. They wanted me to come with it. So we did last summer or two summers ago, we did a short four-month stint of Baz in Vegas with Cirque du Soleil Theatrical co-producing. Hmm. And that was when the breakdown came out for Untitled Cirque Project on Broadway. Um, and they flew me to New York for that. And then it kind of just like, they kept cutting people <laughs> and letting people go. <laughs> and eventually there were two of us. And then eventually they let her go. And it was just me. And I'm like, so I guess I got the part. I don't know. And then this story was a very parallel like girl discovered in singing in a nightclub in LA, which is exactly what happened to me. And hmm. it's, I mean, not that it's been like, I can't say it's been a star turn, like I'm, you know, uh, it's, but it has been very life changing. So, like, did they show up like in the show and they're like, I'm gonna make you a star, come with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 something like that. Like with a French accent a little bit? Yeah, yeah. That's something yeah. like that. Um, <laughs> so, the show itself, I mean, the show itself cost what, $25 million to, to put up, I believe I read. And I I'll, Resting on your shoulders, literally, <laughs> or figuratively, resting on your and your shoulders, literally. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> is there any pressure that you feel from that? Different from things you've done in the past, you're like, "Oh crap, this is twenty-five million dollars compared to a couple thousand or more from past productions." I couldn't allow the pressure to get to me, and now I've just trained myself to not feel it because I couldn't. There was no way I could juggle um, actually learning the show and creating the show and being artistic within it. Um, and being able to do it for a year, you know, I don't know how many performances we've done now, but that is a mental feat in itself. So to think about the, to think about being a spokesperson for the show and to think about being the face of the show and stuff like that, I just couldn't even think about it. And I, I just let it kind of like slide under and hoped that I did a good job. Right. So Seth and Claudette, um, musical director and stage manager, were you, were either of you involved in the creative process of developing the show or were you brought in after the fact, like when it was more finished? Well, uh, may I start? Please do. OK. Um, I, th I think Cirque, and this is very normal for Cirque, is they, they come to a, a creation, as, as they're called, um, with Not a, an evolutionist, but yeah. <laughs> okay. something like that. Come on, Google Joe, guys. Let's go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> they, they, they come to creation with a sort of template and um, a framework for how to develop in the show, and then because there's so many unique um, elements available to them during the, the creative process, I think a lot of individuals are tapped for contribution. So I'd say that I, I couldn't give you a percentage, but yes, there was a framework in place when we arrived, and then there was a lot of work that got done creatively during the last uh, few months of creation, which you showed up uh, when? When did you start? December 27th. Okay, so I was there a few days later, as were most of the rest of us. Uh, so yes, there were some <laughs> things done, and then uh, it was a huge collaborative creation so very like, swiftly you said December that. 27th of 2014? Or 15? 15. 15. 15. Yeah. Okay, so the yeah. show, that's actually not a lot of time to put it's a show not, together. Not, not really. It, it's a, it was an incredibly qu uh, quick process for Cirque and an incredibly long process for Broadway. Uh, because, you know, when you're starting, I may be jumping ahead, but when you're starting a Broadway show, you're dealing with a story that already exists. You're dealing with music that already exists. You're taking uh, Sunset Boulevard and you're remounting it, or, you know, maybe with a different concept, but it's, it's a show that already exists. Our shows don't exist. We build them and make 
make them together, which I, I mean, the word creation is a little annoying, but it is what we do. We basically mm -hmm. find people who have skills and have all kinds of skills, a wide variety of skills, and then figure out how to use those in, in the best or worst way, in different ways, to <laughs> make a show. Um, so, so all of us were, were present for the, for the creation period. There's, you know, there, there are production meetings and, and, and design meetings years and years and years ahead of December 27th, 2015. But I mean, even you guys started January 4th, right? Yes. Yeah, we all started January 4th. We all walked into a room, met each other, and sat down and talked about the story of Paramore and how we were going to try to tell that. Oh, that's interesting. So, so you were basically presented with, with the finished concept. You're like, OK, how can we turn this into something bigger and better? Um, so that's really interesting. It, in terms of, of the music, though, the original, or not original, but all of the other Cirque shows, your traditional shows have tons of vamping and tons of like waiting on the, ac on the acrobats to get set. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, that doesn't quite work when you're telling a story and you have to keep a pace of getting the story told to all of your, of your audience. How, do you, how did that get adapted into, into this, <laughs> uh, this show? Great question. You've done your research. <laughs> saw the show. Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, this is a real hybrid show musically. So we, we still have a few of the straight acrobatic sort of numbers. And um, for anyone who's interested in music tech, or, or uh, we, we usually run Cirque shows on a software called Ableton Live. Um, and it's something that um, we started probably about 10 years ago. And it's, it's a great way to, to build the music kind of in a modular way. Because uh, any given day, I'll get a report from Claudette and stage management saying that this act is cut, or we need to modify this act because somebody's injured. So you're right, the, the music, there's a lot of vamps built in, um, a lot of so, cueing. So you're not like looking at scores. Is it like blocks of? It's, it's both, because the, 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 the pre-recorded stuff and the, the click track is augmented by live musicians, or the other way around, depending on how you want to look at it. Right. Um, how so many people are in the orchestra? There's eight musicians in our orchestra. Um, and then we're running the Ableton Live, and then we have the, the full ensemble singers and the, the stars on stage. So we, we still also have you know, traditional sort of book songs that play top to bottom. Um, and then we have hybrid songs where there's a, a song bookended by an acrobatic act in the middle. So they're, they're built in all sorts of different ways to accommodate the, the various styles that you would have to to be able to run them uh, successfully during the show. Right, right. So real quick, um, let's get the slideshow rolling. We actually, they sent us a bunch of stills of some of the acrobatics happening throughout the show, so that'll be playing. But um, for, I guess, Ruby, how much of the acrobatics did you get to participate in? And then same question, the reverse, for the two of you, how many? How much of the singing and dancing do you guys do? <laughs> um, well, when I found out I got the job, they wanted me to um, go and take my, a physical at the Cirque du Soleil headquarters, which um, I didn't know what it was going to entail. But uh, I started doing like pull-ups like a mad woman. Um, <laughs> when I found that out, I was like, Oh god, oh god! Um, oh, it wasn't too. It wasn't too hard. It was like you have to be able to do ten push-ups and you have to be able to like close your eyes and stand on one leg and stuff like that. Um, but they also wanted me to do harness training to see if I was comfortable in the air and see if I was comfortable upside down, and because um, they had planned on doing a, a bit at the end of the show where I was going to be flying, um, which I still do. It's not to the extent that I imagined when we were training it, because I was flying around doing all kinds of stuff. Um, that was kind of the only acrobatic stuff that I did, other than working with these guys a little bit on some lifts and trying to get comfortable. As a dancer, Like the, it was diff a different kind of partnering than I was used to. Um, so I had to kind of figure out how to adjust. Um, and that was about it, though. I mean, everything else is way beyond my uh, capacity. Would you, would you want to do more? Like, if they said, all right, we're going to have you sing upside down. Like, you got a little Spider-Man kiss, which I think is mm -hmm. in the slideshow here somewhere. Yeah. Um, you don't have to sing upside down, though, right? No, I don't have to sing upside down. I mean, I had grand visions of like, oh, what if I could do, pull like a pink moment and be like singing on some silks, you know? <laughs> but there just there wasn't enough time for that in the creation. I would have had to have trained it for a year. Right. There just wasn't time. At one time, you did you did sing while hanging upside oh, down. That's right. Or yeah. falling, dying, flying in. That's right. That but that didn't make it. Lots of things like didn't make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Tomas Rafael, you guys, uh, would you rather do more singing and dancing, or do you like what you do? We like what we, what we do, but I could do more. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I treat this as a, as, a, as a fun, and everything I do is, is, is always for fun. 
you know, then maybe that, that's why it's so easy and, and I enjoy it so much. Then, except acrobatics, I, 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 will, I will say I do more, I'm, I'm featuring through the whole show doing obviously acrobatics, but uh, I will call my job as well, beside acrobatics, more like a character, character work, you know, in mm -hmm. the different, 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 different characters through the different scenes during the show, then that's fun as well, you know. The, o other than this, uh, I'm just singing one song on the end, which is the final song. As, you know, they so they, they didn't want me to sing more. So <laughs> did they, like they had Ruby go and do a physical, did they have both of you go and do a vocal audition? No. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, they, they didn't go that far. <laughs> I think, I think, All right, give us Twinkle Twinkle. All right, you can I think time, the idea was uh, to give us a little bit of uh, taste of being a singer, which which all of us have been kind of scared about. And uh, I think it would be a challenge for me. Like, I, I was hoping that we're going to get a little bit more of, of chances of singing. That would be like great challenge. Mm -hmm. So far, like I, I love this show because there's, as you see on the, on the photos, that uh, on the slides, that we have so many different costumes, so many different sets, and we have to fit in to be like kind of realistic, be in character. So it gives us a variety of different emotions that we have to show, different, uh, uh, different behaviors. And to put this uh, kind of like fit this with the with all the acrobatics that we have to do, and and so everything will look smooth and realistic. So that that's the big challenge. Comparing to 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 other shows where where like usually like with Cirque, there's uh, there's more uh, more of a being. Acrobat, show your skills. You have your own act. You have to take care of it. And after after your act, you usually you just have like one little cue in the background. Here we like, especially me and Tomek, we like basically in every single, not every single, but in a lot of the scenes. And we have to like change costumes. Like and and this this is this is a great challenge for me, and I'm really happy about being on Broadway and and to to feel this. Yeah, that's that's a nice hybrid, I guess. It's probably something unusual for for the traditional acrobat or or you know kind of circus performer, for lack of a, a better word, because um, the show is split. Other than like basically the three leads, really, the show is split kind of down the middle between acrobats and straight up theater dancers, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. what per, during part of the creative process, what, how did that? I guess, how did that magic number, I guess, like a 50-50 split happen? I mean, because it seems logical to me that being a hybrid of musical theater and Cirque, it was, you know, a conscious decision? Uh, I mean, I'm sure it was definitely a conscious decision. Decision. Um, I mean, yes, there are acrobats out there that can sing and dance, and there are singers and dancers out there that can do acrobatics, but when you're trying to... I guess bring the the talent level that we have on stage up to Broadway and Cirque standards. You're really looking for high level acrobatics and high level singing and dancing. And um, I'm sure there are people out there, and we do have people in our shows that have both of those qualities and skills. But they're very few and far between. Um, so I think that it just naturally happened that way. We found the number of acrobats that we needed to to support the acrobatics in the show, and then we kept adding to that and adding to that and adding mm -hmm. to that. And you know the number of uh, of ensemble Broadway performers, singers, dancers that we needed then also you know to to supplement that section, that area and avenue of the show. So, yeah, going into that, I guess you're either really, you're probably really, really, really good at something, at one thing, or you're mostly kind of very good at a bunch of things, right? Jack of all trades or highly specialized. And the, the, the acrobats, to me, like some of them have Olympic backgrounds, yes? Mm -hmm. So how did, I, is that a natural transition to be like, I want a gold medal, I'm going to go work for Cirque now? Yeah, she talked about that. <laughs> I think uh, we here we have like really specially chosen cast to be able to do like with with kind of variety of skills. A lot of us like me, Tomasz, we've been in Polish uh, national team in, in sport acrobatics, and I know like uh, Lee was Olympian on a, on a trampoline. We have like 
guys from like uh, performers or I don't know how, how to say it uh, that then training in a national circus school in, in Montreal and they're really high skilled they have like really like big uh, they have variety of skills and they have they're special uh, specialized in let's say like hand to hand but they have skills in, in, in on other apparatus and uh, I think that makes this cast really really special because it's not that we we've been brought like it's not been a uh, specialty acts put in the show. It was just mix and match of, of different different acrobatic skills but and also, different different acts. Sorry. Also also like uh, that's why like we have the so called creation process, you know, then that's why the, the the show is not set in stone right on the beginning, you know, you, you bring different talents to the to the to the to the board, you know, and then you, you see the talent, you, you work with the talent and then you, you kind of tweak the, the basic scenario, you know, and then you add to it, you can change it, you can be flexible with it, you know, then you're not like you're stepping into the stage, and that's what you're gonna do, and I'm like, but I cannot do that, you know what I mean, even if I can, for example, do some of the skills, and, and then, oh, can you do this? No, but that's, that, that's the cool uh, side of the cr being creative, you know, you can replace certain ideas with different skills, you know, that's, that's why cre creative process is so interesting, and that's why uh, it's not set in stone on the beginning, you know? That's why we have my time. Yes, Doug, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I might be wrong, but just from observing um, kind of everyone's background, uh, you know, and um, my boyfriend is a, an artist, uh, an acrobat in the show, so I've gotten to know, you know, he was on the Olympic track as a trampolinist, but I feel like in America, you know, you're in gymnastics, your parents put you in gymnastics, it's not really a, I'm going to be in Cirque one day mentality, it's more like a, I just want to tumble, and then I'm going to cheerlead, and then I'm going to like cheerlead in college kind of thing. And it doesn't seem like it's this, the same track as uh, a lot of countries in Europe. I mean, I feel like that's on, that's uh, an idea that children get at a young age because Cirque du Soleil it allows you to do what you love to do, but also it gives you uh, more longevity doing it, and also you get to play characters and you get to travel the world. And I feel like you know, as a, if you're training for the Olympics, it's very staunch and. You do it, and it's your life. But um, you know, with Cirque, you're able to to do your skill and have a lot of fun at the same time. And for some reason, it's not as sought after in, in the states. I don't know why, but maybe maybe now, maybe now that it's really like starting to infiltrate. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's, go for it. two things. I think I think it is starting to. I mean, Montreal has is is known for its circus school, which happens to be right across the street from Cirque du Soleil's international headquarters. Um, so, I mean, coincidence? Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you know, and so so I do know when we have a lot of Americans, several Americans in our show that decided to go train at, at circus school in Montreal that now you know are following that the the path of that's what I want to do. Um, but the other thing about you know the the, gym, the gymnast path when you reach the ripe old age of what like 17 or 21, you're like you're looking at retirement, right? What else do you do after that? So it's it certainly is. I mean, you can you can do circ these sorts of things a whole lot longer than you can be on the, you know, the professional athlete, that athletic track. Yeah, and the acts have to, of course, be designed in a way that they're not going to break your body every night because on Broadway you have to do it eight times a week. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. it's not like you go to the Olympics, it's your one thing, you break <laughs> all your bones, but you want a gold medal and you're okay. Yay! Uh, <laughs> so, I, but I want to take a step back here. I want to touch on something um, that, you, that you mentioned a second ago about the show can sort of evolve. Traditionally, in musical theater, you know, from a stage management perspective, of course, like after the, sh the show is workshopped and it's the director comes in and they're like, this is how I do it. We try this. It doesn't work. Let's cut this. Let's cut this. And then when it opens, it's set. It's written, right? Mm -hmm. And the stage, manager, the, the stage manager becomes like boss mom, right? Like, you can't change this or I will fine you. Right. Um, <laughs> equity fine. So... <laughs> From your perspective, yes. how is this, from a, as a stage manager, how is this show different? Like, it has to be able to change, right? It's, it's completely different. I mean, I, I was brought in because of my circuit experience and during the creation process. Um, the, my first, the, the first uh, stage manager was, is, had, has Broadway experience. He's the Broadway guy. And, and the marriage of the two of us, because we would sit down and he'd be like, 
I'm sorry, what are you, what are you saying? They're not going to play, Seth's not going to play the same music every night. He kept trying to like chart out the, the call book, you know, to go, oh, and then there'll be eight bars of this music and then I'll switch to that music. I'm like, no, you're watching the guy on the teeterboard when he grabs his legs. Then Seth is going to see the same mm -hmm. thing. He's going to change the music. It's, um, it's, it's something that, that, I mean, comes naturally to us and that, that flexibility, mental and physical, mm -hmm. um, is, is just part of, of Cirque, you know? I mean, I, I think what, what, we found challenging on this show is bringing that Broadway aspect in, the telling the story. We can't be as flexible as we're accustomed to at a Cirque show. At a Cirque show, we don't really have a story. I mean, there's like a feeling and a theme and a concept, but we're not telling a story from beginning to end. There's no linear um, story to be told. So we can kind of just play with, oh, if these guys aren't feeling well today, we're just going to take their act out and put something else in there because that's fine in Cirque du Soleil land. Um, in, in Broadway, it, it's not necessarily that way. So we've, we've figured out a way on a regular basis to have the show be flexible and have different um, acts and different parts of the show um, stay the same, but also have plans B, C, D, all the way up to G or further. Um, and that's just, uh, it's, I, I think a lot of the Broadway performers had trouble with that at the beginning because it is very, very different from their experience. But now it's amazing to see how quickly they can turn on a dime and go, oh, we're doing one of those kind of shows today. OK, great, we're fine. And the first time, it was just met with like eyes as wide as saucers. I'm sorry, we're not going to do that entire scene in the, in the show tonight? No, it's fine. We're going to jump from here to here. Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> and now they're just like, OK, great, we're going to do one of those tonight. So you have, I guess, a whole, you said a whole bunch of, of standbys. How often do people actually get hurt? I mean, obviously, they're, the, the twins, the guys with abs for days, um, <laughs> they, they are performing over the audience without mats. I, you know, I'm sitting there like this when I'm watching them because, A, they're amazing, and B, they're amazing. But um, <laughs> like, do, what happens when something that major gets hurt, has to get cut? Is, do you have contingencies? Of course, the, I guess there's swings for the principals, but... Um, do you have the same sort of thing? There, for... there are swings for the principals, swings for the, the Broadway ensemble. Um, and with, with the acrobats, we don't have a lot of people on standby. I mean, we pretty much, if we have, if, if everyone's in and feeling fine, almost without, almost across the board, they're all in the show. And if we're not all feeling fine, we just have a few less people in the show. Um, some of the acts we do will. Uh, we have, we have a replacement. There's, we have one replacement act that we can put in place of the twins with abs for days um, flying. She can also <laughs> go in in place of uh, the juggler in the top of um, act two number. Um, otherwise, our other, most of the other acts have multiple people in them. You know, it's, it's an act with, you know, that involves four guys jumping or seven guys or, you know, eight, eight men and women flinging each other through the air. Um, it's the, the solo acts, the duo acts, and the trio that make it a little more difficult if those people aren't in. So I want to rewind even further. I want to talk about the origins of Cirque for a second, which I don't know how much you've been briefed on any of this. Um, back in 1982, right? Yes, in Quebec, it started under the English, under, under a French name, obviously, but the English, English translation means the High Heels Club. I won't even attempt to pronounce the original name. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. High heels meaning men on stilts, or people on stilts, not you know, actual women's high heels. Uh, and at that time, of course, you know, we can get into this a little bit, you know, the closing of Barnum and Bailey and the whole circus industry right now. But at that time, you know, of course, circus was still sort of a big thing, even in North America. But why, why did circus start in such a different format than the traditional circus format? Like, why no animals? Why, why tell, not tell, I mean, I guess not telling a story is normal, but do you have any insight into that? Well, um, I'm not going to speak for Guy here, our founder, but from my understanding was that um, you know the, the reason that Cirque exists and grew as it did, I, I believe, uh, with my experience with the company, has to do with his vision and his creative energy and what he wanted to do. Um, he spent a number of years as a busker in, in Quebec and traveling all over the world studying different circuses. Um, and he's an incredible uh, businessman and, and visionary and had some great partners early on. So I think that he set out to do something that was, that was quite different. And it did start very small um, in, in you know, little tents and little, little community shows and, and, and whatnot around Quebec. So I think that that culture was born at the very beginning of the company. And I think that they had some very uh, big core ideas 
uh, from the very you know from the very beginning, which enabled them to to pull off some of the feats that they did. You know, when they first took their their show to Los Angeles, and the story goes, they didn't if they weren't successful there, they wouldn't have had enough money to go back to Quebec. So th there was a lot of really <laughs> like uh, to travel back home. Yeah, exactly. They would have been stranded yeah. there, um, or so the story goes. I wasn't there. I don't know. But um, I, I think it, it has to do with that early culture of risk taking um, and having a very clear vision of doing something completely different and artistic and musically as well, you know, from the, from the start. So. so it took almost nine years, though, to become, I guess, really big because it was 19, 1991, the first tour in Asia became, I guess, what you would call Cirque's big break in that it was it had a $40 million investment from Fuji Television, um, which, of course, $40 million rivals most Broadway shows on in here in New York right now anyway. Um, I know, I, I guess that was still before the time of both of you guys, but do you, do you from the stories, like, did the culture have taken an upswing immediately from there? And, and that was the point, I think, when multiple shows started happening at once. Uh, Japan happened, and then I think for the longest time, up until around 95, there, there were only single shows, and there were a lot of the same people that were in them, the, in them all doing, doing different characters. But, um, but Japan happened, and then uh, there was a North American tour. Uh, we reinvented the circus, and then that landed in a parking lot in Las Vegas, and then Mystere kind of grew from that with a relationship that they made with Steve Wynn at um, Treasure Island. Um, and I think that it was certainly a, a showing Cirque du Soleil and showing the Nouveau Cirque uh, concept and idea to the rest of the world. And, and in doing that, gathering uh, momentum and fans and energy and money along with that. Right. So yeah, then fast forward to, I guess, uh, 2015, when, or 14, when they started the, the concept for this. And so Paramore itself, is set in the golden age of, of Hollywood, in the 1930s, right? Um, and let's show the, the, the photo of Ruby in costume, because I think it's, it's just, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful there. Um, so the whole, the whole show is, is about, yeah, the golden age, the time when, when <coughs> I guess these were when the talkies, right, it had become a big thing, and everyone was going to see a, a, a movie um, every week. Why do you think they decided to target this specific decade for, for the show? Well, I know there was a lot of inspiration that came from a show that was in Los Angeles, um, Erice, and it was, um, it, it was very filmatic, and it was, you know, the, uh, the theme was film and filmmaking. I think a lot of that had to do with um, Philippe de Couffle. Um, you know, in Paris, he does a lot of work with projections and um, silhouettes, and he just, you know, he's very um, driven, you, you know, toward that kind of imagery, and so I think that that probably had a lot to do with the creation of that show, and then from that show, um, you know, Philippe directed and choreographed our show, and uh, I think a lot of the inspiration came from from that. And you know, when we were in creation, we weren't even sh we weren't sure what year it was going to be. We weren't sure if it was the '50s, if it was going to be the '20s. You know, I had like a flapper dress at one point. At one point, we were workshopping um, like a silent film, like a way to move and blink to make it look like we were on <laughs> silent film. Apparently, and we did it two hours one day. Two hours, we're like, you know, like <laughs> clinking glasses as and trying to look. So it, that the the um the, the fact yeah, it was like it was a whole day. I think we did that. I was sore. Um, and then we finally landed on like, actually, um, let's try to like really hone in on what yearage we're we're in right now and so that we yearage decide. yes yeah Very technical yearage it's a term. Yeah. um <laughs> so we can like have proper costumes and you know stuff so that's how we ended up in the golden age and also because i think as we were figuring out the story um you know i felt like it was reminiscent of the studio you know when the studios owned the women basically and they're like no you know whatever we say that you need to do you will do it including including marrying this man who is gay but nobody is allowed to know that like <laughs> that's kind of like the time you know and so it, and it was we'll all very inspiring um <laughs> and that's kind of how it happened i think Hmm. So uh, we turn up the audience light or the aisle lights. We've got two miles in the uh, two mics in the aisles. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm trying to say. If you got a question, get up, come up to a mic and we can uh, we can work that in. But going back now to present day, of course Barnum and Bailey having issues. They are closing their doors very soon, unfortunately. Um, 
this is maybe this is a sensitive question. Do you feel like Cirque has contributed at all to kind of like Cirque on the rise, traditional on the downfall? Like everything is digital, everything is modern. Cirque incorporates a lot of that. And do you feel it has influenced the present day situation at all? I, th I, I think it must have. I'm sure it has, but I think it's also a, 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 a what's the word, like a change or, or die also, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you don't continue to adapt with technology, with what, what we all want to see, then, you know, yeah, don't, you, you won't be around anymore. Um, I mean, I know, like, Ringling Brothers, what, they got rid of the elephants last year, mm -hmm. you know, but it's still a, a, a traditional theatrical art form, and, uh, and it's, a shame, it's a total shame that they will no longer be performing, but, you know, it's, it's I don't, I don't know, I haven't seen this uh, Ringling Brothers circus show in years and years, um, but I, I get the feeling that it hasn't necessarily kept up with the times. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure we're somewhat responsible, but also, so Does, it's not has, keeping up. Yeah, has Cirque ever had animals? Never had animals in the show, mm -hmm. right? You just have water, which is its own beast, right? right? Yeah, oh, oh, is, that's an amazing show in Vegas. Acrobats are kind of animals. Well, never mind, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Cool. Let's take a question. So I've seen several of the Cirque du Soleil shows in Vegas, but I've never seen any here. And I'm wondering what kind of differences you uh, experience in, like, the theater, the environment, like, the audience. Does the audience interact or react differently in any way? I'm just, like, curious what it, how different the ones here are. Well, the... the I'll, May I? Go. The, uh, the Vegas shows are all uh, typically 90 minutes straight, no intermission. The theaters themselves are generally designed for the specific show, so they're very immersive feeling, um, all the way down to you know having surround sound built in every seat. So it's a very immersive uh, sort of environment in Las Vegas. The audience is there. Um, some people, it is a destination to go see a Cirque show, so you have very excited uh, audience and Cirque tourists who go to see shows there. You also have people who just receive tickets at the last minute from the hotel who are drunk and fall asleep in the front row. <laughs> so the Vegas audiences are very, uh, there's a lot of variety and a lot of interesting people there. Um, and this show, uh, anyone want to talk about Paramore and how it differs from Vegas? No, I think you, 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 already, you already said it. Like the, in Vegas, all the show, what you said, is like a one continuous thing. Here we have, which I'm not used to it, even until this day when we have this intermission. And I'm like, <laughs> kills me. But, <laughs> uh, but it, that, that, I think that's the main difference. As an as a, as a audience, I, I think it's every day brings different audiences. doesn't matter if you're in, in Vegas or in New York. Then for me, the feedbacks are, 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 are quite similar, you know? So, some days you have very energetic crowds, and doesn't matter if you're in Vegas or in New York, and same, you know. So, uh, then, then, and sometimes you have very like quiet and and not really responsive audience. I don't know how they, you know, every, everyone takes the show differently, you know. But sometimes you have really loud crowds, and sometimes you have very like nice, polite. This is, this I do is. feel like because it is in a proscenium, our show, there's something about sitting in the theater and you know having the proscenium in front of you, and it feels like you're all in it together, kind of thing, on stage and off. And I mean, I just love watching when I'm not when I'm not doing anything on stage, and I'm actually just watching an, an acrobatic number. The theater goers who are just expecting to see a Broadway show, who all of a sudden are like seeing something amazing happen, and it's and they're so close to it, and it's it's supposed to be theater, but it's like m much more amazing than they expected. I watch their faces and it's just like, they can't believe what they're seeing, you know? It's a, um, I feel like we get a lot of first time Cirque people and they're not, um, we, we don't let them down in any way with our show. It's still as, as amazing as the Vegas shows, I think, but in a different way. Yeah, it's good. It's defined a new genre. I mean, it's a hybrid. It, it is actually a musical theater show with Cirque acrobatics built in. And I actually went to the show expecting the opposite. I thought it was going to be, like I've seen a ton of Cirque shows, and I expect there to be like a little story here and there, sort of like, you know, the comic, the comic relief that happens in your normal Cirque mm -hmm. shows. And, but no, there's like full-blown professional musical theater actors who have been trained for their whole lives to do this for a living, and then there's, they are accented by all of the other amazing abs and biceps that happen <laughs> around them. Um, so it, it surprised me in a very, very good way. But um, yeah, question over here. Sure. Uh, when, I, when we first saw the Paramore with my wife, we were so impressed with the production that my wife said, 
I would like to see the production stage manager <laughs> so <I> texted <laughs> her, I'm actually <laughs> <laughs> And actually the question for you, Claudette, what, uh, what postgraduate or, or just general, what education one needs to have in order to go into stage management? Uh, well, I, I describe, for those of you who don't know what a stage manager does, other than being what, rule mom, um, the stage manager is the air traffic controller of the show, is the best way I can describe it. Uh, when the house lights go down, basically we're managing all the technical elements, calling all of the light cues and those sorts of things. So um, being anal as the day is long, but at the same time, patient more than anything else. I mean, because at, at Cirque especially, uh, I mean, which is what the majority of my professional experience is, uh, you never know what fire you're going to walk into. And we have, we're putting out fires all day, every day. Um, and, you know, I don't think we've put on the same show twice in the 400 and something times we've performed Paramore. So it's all about, it's, it's putting the puzzle pieces together to, we always end up making the same image, Paramore, but the puzzle pieces don't always fit together the same way. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, when I'm interviewing stage managers, I, I talk about that. I'm like, you really honestly have to enjoy doing puzzles, you know, like just use, using your mind in that way of, 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 of shifting the way you're looking at it today and just being, in, being aware of, of the fact that it's not the same every day. Does that answer Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Very cool. Does anybody else have any questions? Because otherwise... Rumor has it that Tomas and Rafael are working on a new strongman act. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in a silent movie. See? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, silent um, movies. Yeah, there you go. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> Would you two be so kind as to give us a little bit of uh, a sample of this? Yeah, why not? I think that we, we, we have to shift the chairs a little bit. Okay, we'll yes. move back. I'll move for this. I don't want to get hurt. <laughs> but continuing what we were saying earlier about... Uh, I'll just talk while, while everyone watches you take your clothes oh. off. Um, <laughs> this is the best uh, uh, interview I've ever done, right. sitting in the audience. I know. I mean, acrobats like have to have many skills, and then you guys just figured out or decided, yeah, we want to use the skills that we have in a different way than we're used at Paramore. And then how can you then continue to use that on a show after Paramore, making it a you know marketable skill? You've got these talents. Show us what they are. <laughs> yeah, and then, for example, in this particular area, like we like kind of unusual, so what usually you see as a, as a duo, guy and like sleeping each other or, or the big guy. guy or two small guys. <laughs> anyway, uh, then we try to, we, the hardest part of this is just to find a way to make it work. Then it's, uh, basically, it's, we, we, we try to find a way to make this, this happen then. You know, we both big guys and try to do something together and see, see what happens. All right. Surprise, I'm part of it. <laughs> Thank you. So you guys obviously practice lifting each other at home all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then to round it all out, Ruby, would you mind bringing us home? <laughs> all right. 
normally in this number in the show, I'm like, we're all running around and we're, cre we're creating um, what we call the live movie posters. So it's like an old fashioned style movie poster. We have two cameras on stage and we recreate it by assembling everything, including like the title with a spotlight on it um, and then flashing to the actual poster. So there's a lot going on, a lot more going on than what you'll see today, but I'll try to like fill it in with jazz hands or something. <laughs> Now I have the answer, become quite the dancer. We're tumbling around day and night. It's a wild roller coaster with each movie poster. The more I soak in the spotlight, had me right at hello. Now I wouldn't let go. Getting used to this phase of the game must be the second best thing. The bliss of your very first kiss Get to drink it whenever you like Go from picture to picture I speak of elixir One taste and it changes your life In a single heartbeat You get knocked off your feet With no prenup You're only to blame Stardom fits like a it's the honeymoon days Oh, babe, let me bask in this moment Take it in for a while, oh, I'm told It just never gets old Now this feeling's brand new I finally get to own it For a lifetime, I thought what I would not happen to me when out of the blue every dream has come true like with any good story of glamour and glory a dark cloud will block out the sun your thoughts will get sober vacation is over i hate to be spoiling the fun still i'm faithfully yours with no plans of divorce as there's still so much left of this flame you're my sweet candy but i'm addicted so far it's the Come back up, keep it going. One more time, casting creatives of Paramore. I got him to bow, that's cool. Thank you. Thanks, man.